everything that I am has been compromised in a way that I have no idea how to even begin. I don't have time today to even go through it. I want to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever walked into a room full of people and feel at home and welcomed? How many of you have felt that way? Okay, majority of people, so that's really good. So please keep that moment, those feelings that you had when you walked into a room until the end of my talk. I've been very fortunate to live many lives in many places. Think that I am has been to many, many, many challenges. But recently I realized that we forget that we come from a lot of people. But there are a few things that describes who we are. Of course, our gender, our race, our nationality, our ethnicity, and of course, that last one. But it seems that in America, we focus on that last one a lot. All of these things that we are are the metrics to measure how, to measure our identity, but not to really measure what we're capable of. But also, as well, there are labels. There are labels that come with this our gender, our race, our nationality, our ethnicity, and of course, the last one. There are stories and stigma that comes with it. For me, growing up in Rwanda, my ethnicity was the first one that I was attacked. I grew up in a wonderful home in Kigali. I was that kid in the paradise because everywhere I went, people fed me, braided my hair, and also told on me if I got in trouble. And I got in trouble quite often. And so my community, my family, was everything that I truly love, just like any other kids. Of course, the conflict that all of you know as the genocide in 1994, that left million dead and million displaced. We got very lucky, maybe like is not the right word. Our parents realized that the conflict was going to be really bad, so they sent my older sister and I away out in the country to our grandparents. But things also got worse there. Claire was 15 and I was six. And that's where I say our running began. So this time our ethnicity is being attacked, but then slowly I also learned that my gender was also being attacked as a female. In Rwanda, the first thing that they did was to come and take all the girls and rape them. It was the way to eliminate, and most of the ripper, people who were raping were HIV, AIDS infected. So that's level number two. Our life on Iran, literally on Iran, and I don't have time or language to really tell you what this was. Like many children, when the conflict started, I thought it was one of those movies that you watch under the pillow with your eyes closed and ears plugged, hoping it will end soon. In the reality, there were no pillows large to hide me or meet the ears from the noise. So Claire and I started, I'm going to go very quickly, started by walking and crawling. We ended first our first country in Burundi, our first refugee camp. And I sort of want to show you an image because I don't have pictures. But refugee camp, how many of you have been in refugee camps? OK. All of you should go to refugee camp. If you really want to make a change, all of you should go to refugee camp. 
So I first refugee camp experience, that's when I realized that not only that my nationality, my ethnicity, and my gender was being attacked, but also my breath, because if you get sick in one day in refugee camp, you're gone. So our life, we received corn and beans. We had a no water, so finally started. I learned for my first time how to go fetch water and how to get woods. The food that we're given and the tents that we're given, not that we're not grateful, you cannot put a human in that thing for a year. And we did. We lived in those tents for a year, having those two meals for a year. And no one really dare from the UN or UNHCR come and say, so how is the corn? How is the beans? How are you doing? So. Claire and I thought, well, let's get out of here. So Claire decided, I'm going to figure out how to get out of here. I'm going to get married. At age 17, she got married to someone who worked in a, with, with one of the organization, I'm not allowed to say. Um, he lived in the Congo, so we left. And we started our walk. We went to Congo with her husband. And a year in Congo. War started. We left Congo. We were in Tanzania, another refugee camp. Again, in terms of what Gideon said, was no. <laughs> no on life. The way people were treated. The life every single day was the most difficult. No matter how we tried. We grew up in a city, so we knew how to hustle. But no hustling. <laughs> that is strong enough to make you survive a refugee camp. So we decided, OK, we're going to leave again. We went to Malawi. Malawi lives in another refugee camp. And that refugee camp, Lilongwe, is still there today. Refugees from Somalia, Congo, Burundi, Rwanda, and some Ethiopia. Tens and tens of thousands of people are stuck in there. And their hope, their hope is that International Organization of Migration is going to bring them to the United States. So they sit and they wait. With every inch of their hope is clinging to this not realistic because they can't go back home. So Clara thought, well, this is not a good enough refugee camp. I mean, she tried all her best to be able to really remind people, get up and ask for your right. She said, we're getting out of here. So we left. Went to another refugee camp. I call this shopping for the best refugee camp ever. <laughs> In Mozambique, also went to another refugee camp. And everywhere we went, in every country, either we, if we were in a refugee camp outside of a refugee camp, we learned how to fit in completely perfect. The way people walk, the way people talk, the way people change ideas language completely within two months. So Mozambique, South Africa, South Africa, that was the best place to kind of fit in in Durban. Um, then after that, International Organization of Migration brought us, brought us to Chicago. And this is Claire and her family and I. I'm going to go very quickly here. So in Chicago. Finally, we have a family, we have a community, we have safety. And then, for me, I started to realize I really need to go deeper. I really need to understand because I got out, but millions and millions of people in the world are still questioning everything they are. So I ask myself, who am I? Who am I in all this? Am I American now? Am I qualified to sit on this chair? Am I qualified to cross the state? Am I qualified to breathe? Am I qualified to be a girl? So these questions for the past, I would say, 20 years have been on my mind. So going back again, in terms of thinking about social innovation, if you are just a regular person, or you're a company, or run a nonprofit, Really think about how you serving person whose gender is being compromised. 
being underappreciated because your gender, if it's put in a most vulnerability, or your race, America, we have that. Your nationality, oh, we don't want them to cross the border because they actually want to feed themselves and feed their children. The ethnicity, there's a lot of also labels that comes with ethnicity. And as well, having stuff, not having stuff. So what I'm slowly learning is that we need to go back, completely go back, and look each other as a human. Truly look each other as a human and not allow all these labels that are behind this facade determine our value as a human, our potential of what we're able to do. So today, I'm asking you personally, when you walked to that room and fell at home, are you able to do that for other people who are coming in to you? individually, as a company, making products, are you thinking about each person as a human? Not their circumstances that they're under because of this, or their experiences. And I think you could do that by one thing. Go in. Listen, ask someone about the experience. You're from Mexico, okay, tell me about your experience. Or you transgender, okay, tell me how we feel. And as well, be aware, be aware of these labels. Don't just take the labels, be aware of it. And then lastly, let's involve each other. So if you go to a refugee camp or you go to the most poorest country, Ask people, what is it that you, you can do to be able to better your community, to be able to better yourself? And then you could say, here are the tools that I have. What is going to work the most? Short term, long term. So I know this is a lot to take in, but going back again, we all want to feel at home we all want to be accepted. And let's use every tool, technology and non-technological, to be able to listen, to be able to hear, to be able to act together. Thank you so much.